for a very special treat this year, as you very well know. Uh, for those of you who have not had the pleasure of uh, meeting and hearing our good friend, right time Bob Darch, I, I should just mention to you that uh, without exaggerating, uh, Mr. Darch is probably one of the people most responsible for the revival of ragtime in the world because at the time during the 1950s, he, when he was collecting ragtime sheet music, when other people weren't, and the years that he was personally going throughout the Midwest, and introducing, reintroducing ragtime to the small towns of the Midwest, including Sedalia, and making these towns aware of their ragtime heritage. He was doing it on a personal basis, on a one-on-one -on -one relationship, by playing in uh, you know, theaters and saloons and anywhere where he could play his ragtime. And over the years, he had a profound impact upon reestablishing ragtime. And uh, through his very generous sharing of his ragtime sheet music collection, many young people like Traver Titchener's and myself and people who were collecting in those years had a chance to get copies of a lot of these very rare originals, which he had himself preserved. He was also very instrumental in contacting Joseph Lamb and preserving much of the music of Joseph Lamb, uh, which will eventually see the light of day. So it's, uh, it's wonderful that all of those efforts have ended up in not only ragtime being preserved, very much thanks to his efforts, but he, of course, is still delighting audiences, not just in the Midwest, as he was then, but now all over the world. And uh, he has just come back from a, a European tour and leaves Monday for Ireland. So we are indeed very fortunate to have one of the true Great legends of ragtime. Ragtime, Bob Darch. This is flight 496. <laughs> non stop from here to Buffalo. <laughs> We're going to need a little something at the end of this thing to hold it down. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, I might add. And Toronto has always held a, I've always held a blue warm spot in Toronto. Um, it's a place that's treated me very kindly uh, right from the beginning. Through the efforts of Pierre Burton uh, and his writings, why uh, the 76 Club existed and held on for about six years, which was the ragtime place in town. And then Lewis came along down there with the Golden Nugget and other places came out, the Silver Rail, and you can name it on and on and on. Do we have a little weight we can put on the end of this? Anyway, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm not going to deliver a big opus here, but um, just want to tell you how pleased I am to be here. I think it's been nine years since I was here last. Seeing all my friends from Fort Faraway out there, Jim Kinnear and his wife, Lewis. And it's been a... Uh, I don't want to do it. Is that your newest book? Yeah. <laughs>
I'm always happy when it comes out right, too. <laughs> that last note's as far as I'm going. Anyway, uh, called the Georgia Gam Meeting, written by Kerry Mills in 1897, who went on to write such things as Meet Me in St. Louis Louie, and uh, other tunes uh, that were very popular. A little tune this time, just to warm up on, was written by Irving Berlin in 1910, originally called Alexander and his Ragtime Clarionet. And in 1911, why, uh, Ted Snyder, his publisher, told me how to change the lyrics, uh, change the tune to add anything in there, but to add some lyrics as well. And so it happened that uh, that's what he did under protest. And he, he said it was the best thing. When I talked to Berlin, he told me it was the best thing ever happened to him, that uh, Snyder insisted that he change that tune around. It'll never sell as Alexander's ragtime clarinet, the old-fashioned spelling. So he changed it to Alexander's. He asked for, uh, Snyder, he said, what, what, what do you want me to put in there? And Snyder, also answering him back, said, well, I don't care. Swanee River played in ragtime. It matter to me what you put in there, but put something in there. So he changed it. He said, best thing he ever did. He would always thank Snyder for insisting that he re-resurrect that tune from, they had, uh, I think, 10,000 copies originally published that, and Snyder had 9,999 in his garage. Berlin bought the only copy. Uh, that's not quite true, little story, but uh, that's exactly what happened, and Berlin uh, did change it around, and he wrote Alexander's Ragtime Band. He's lived so long, he's 99 years young today, and uh, has an next birthday next February. 99 years young, sound of mind, but frail of body, and doesn't see anybody anymore. I can really say that he's a good friend, and more than an acquaintance. And I've met him about seven times in my lifetime. But anyhow, be that as it may. Uh, Alexander's Ragtime Band, and if you care to hear the swine, we were playing right. Now let's see, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Alexander's
you very much. Right after that, I wrote um, <laughs> Home for Money. A little tune this time written in 1913 until I used to call her baby, but now... to call her baby, but she was just a baby to me. When she said we should wed, I really felt glad. Took her home and introduced her to my dad. That's when I lost my baby. Dad, that's all that cash you see. She never even stopped to say ta-ta. Next thing I knew, she'd gone and married my pa. To think I used to call her baby. Well, now I have to call her And uh, there was a lady came up to me today and said, you, you wrote me the last card in 1955 at the Red Dog Saloon. Well, that is quite a while between cards. <laughs> I'll admit that, especially a prolific writer like myself. But I, I must admit that uh, I can remember the Red Dog Saloon used to have, the bartenders used to wear Mackinaws and they had uh, the sleeves rolled up. There was a fox fur up on the above the bar. It's a dumb fox. And uh, he used to look at that. It was all dusty. And they hired me to play the piano in this place. So we got into white shirts, and before long, we had all the business in town. We had, actually used to open the door so this music could drift out on the street. You'd watch people go by the front of the Red Dog. They'd go out a few steps, and they'd duff, duck in, have free lunch. And they'd come in there, have a free lunch, have a couple of beers, and after a while, we had all the business in town. It was wonderful. And it just, uh, the same thing applied to the, to the 76 Club in a sense. People came in off the street and the 76 uh, lunch we used to have there and Roger Brown was there, I remember those days, and the turkey was there, remember her? Yeah. Jim Kinnear, we all remember turkey. <laughs> she survived one year in that place. But anyhow, she was a neat girl, she was a downer in luck at the time. But anyhow, uh, Many of the, the tunes that were written in those days had to have a clever, a clever lyric, had to have a clever title, and also had to have a bit of music that really made people feel good. There's one tune that I always get a lot of action out of that has always been a pleasure to play. Even on an out-of-tune piano, uh, it, it works. And it's called Spaghetti Rag by George Lyons in 1905. <laughs> You remember that, Jim? They played at your prom in 1906. <laughs> Was that a high school or college? <laughs> Thank you. 
A little medley of tunes this time, starting with Irving Berlin's great hit of 1919, and thought you'd be surprised, because I'm not so good in the house, but oh, oh, in the park. I'm a double knee slapper. <laughs> So good in the house, but oh, 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 in the park, you'd be surprised. I'm not so good in the light, but oh, 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 in the dark, you'd be surprised. Well, I'll admit that I don't look much like a lover. You can't judge no book by its cover. I've got the face of an angel, but man, there's a devil in my eye. And I don't look very strong, but when you sit on my knee, you'd be surprised. I'm a devilish thing when I started to squeeze. You'd be surprised. And at a ball or at a dance, you might think that I was a built for romance, but in a Morris chair, you'd be surprised. <laughs> Always big in Morris chairs. <laughs> by Bob Carlton of Chicago, Illinois. He wrote over 300 tunes, only had one hit. That's all you need. <laughs> John, 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 Jing, Jing, Jing. John, 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 Jing, Jing, Jing. It's so amazingly unappealing to me. I love to hear those ragtime melodies. Just John, 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 Jing, Jing, Jing. Great tunes in the old days had parodies, and this is one of them. Matches, matches, M E T C H E S. Matches, matches, M E T C H E S. You can strike them on wood, strike them on glass. I know a girl who used to strike them on her ashtray. Matches, matches, M E T C H E S. You're scary, eh? <laughs> She wore a pair of PVDs. Jada, Jada, and they hung way down below her knees. She wore them in the summer and she wore them in the fall. The door was ringing, la 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 la. And she tore a pair of PVDs. Moving right along here. Great tune in 1899 by Joey Howard. He wrote in St. Joseph, Missouri. I've been had the pleasure of meeting him in Fort Lauderdale a years ago. I got a little honey, but she's out of sight. Then I had to call her on the telephone. I love my luscious honey, it's mine all right. So you get away and leave a doll alone. And every single morning you will hear me shout, Central, give me a line. Shake it like my honey, then I ring a bell. And this is what I tell that baby mine. Well, hello, my honey. Hello, my baby. Hello. Time gal, send me a kiss by wire. Baby, my heart's on fire. And if you refuse me, honey, you'll lose me. Then you'll be left alone. Baby, won't you telephone? Tell me I'm your own. Pull me up your heart. Atlantic City, New Jersey, and on the boardwalk there's a big plaque that tells about this too. By the sea, by the sea, by the beautiful sea, you and I, you and I, oh, how happy we'll be. When each wave comes a rolling in, sink or swim, and we'll go around and roll around and over and under. Then for air, boys rich and boys rich, oh, what do we care? I love it. Beside the sea, beside the sea, beside the seaside, my beautiful sea. And then he 
he'd row, row, row. Way up that river he would row, row, row. A hug he'd give her and he'd kiss her now and then. And she would tell him when. He'd kiss her once, he'd kiss her twice and try to row again. And then they'd row, row, row. Way up that river he would row, 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 row. Then they'd come to the reeds and do such daring deeds. And then he'd row, row, row. Cakewalk. It was unnamed when he went into John Stark's office, and Stark saw a newsboy out front stealing newspapers, and so he came up with the name Swipesy Cakewalk. So uh, Trevor Tishner was there at this meeting, and Trevor said, "Well, how fast you can play this stuff?" He says, "Not fast." And he said, uh, "You play as fast as you like, as long as you execute those sixty fourths in the second string." <laughs> and he also said that if nobody's dancing, always speed it up at the end. But if they're dancing, keep the tempo. So since there's nobody dancing, we speed it up at the end. That counts for that. Sometimes you get a little criticism from real aficionados on this ragtime business. They say, hey, 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 speeding it up, you're playing too fast. What actually Joplin meant by not too fast, there were a lot of circus music out at the time. Circle Worlds, they were called. Something like this. Now, he didn't want Maple Leaf played like that. That's what he meant by not fast. He didn't mean to play like a dirge. After all, you're not going to a funeral, you're going to a wedding. And this is what the idea of the thing. So anyhow, Swipes of Cake Rock by Arthur Marshall, 19 Ottawa. <laughs> Thank you. 
all fairness, I must uh, say that the last tag on there, of course, is from Sunflower Slow Drag by Scott Joplin, but they were good buddies, so it seemed to be the perfect termination of that tune. Well, I remember this time uh, I asked Paul Bell Smith to uh, do a little research for me. Uh, who wrote uh, Sailing on the Chesapeake? Did you find that out? No, we didn't. Is that right? Okay. We got it right from the, the Los Angeles uh, Watchdog Society over here. <laughs> uh, Botsford and uh, Hass? And Havis, okay. Yeah, this is a very great tune. And actually, it's a real great recording by uh, Turk Murphy and the San Francisco Jazz Band, the part of the expression. The, uh, it's from Clancy A singing it, singing down the chest. <laughs> Like interpretation. All board who's going on board. Steamboat coming. All board who's going on board. Around the bend I seem to see a steamer deer heading here to this pier. We can make it if we only hurry, dear. Is the old Dominion line. Sail, she look pretty as she hugs the shore. Heading for old Baltimore. Hear the paddles turning, see that water churning. She's the queen of Chesapeake Bay. Come on, Nancy, put your best dress on. Come on, Nancy, for the steamboat's gone. And everything is rosy on the old Henry Clay. I'll work for Baltimore, and if we're late, we'll both be sore. Now come on, Nancy, for we miss that boat. We can swim, honey, we can float. Banjo's ringing a good old tune. Up on deck, see those folks there spoon. Cut along close beneath the silvery moon. Sailing down the Chesapeake, oh Lord, for Chesapeake. Sailing down the Chesapeake Bay.
Another tune by Percy Wendrick this time from 1912, entitled Moonlight Bay. If you care to join in, please do. <laughs> suffered from dropsy, disease called dropsy, and uh, he had a nurse that was there with him all the time. And it um, took me almost six months before I could get this appointment. It was on a Saturday afternoon at 12 o'clock. And I got up there at 12, right on the button, they let me in the place, and I started asking all these questions about Moonlight Bay, and, and uh, at the tune I put on your old gray bonnet, and how I got around the right net. And the place called Dover was very close to the Kansas border, right outside of Joplin, going west. I went there and found the town that after he described where it was. It was gone, but it was, you could see all the foundations and everything. But uh, at about 20 after 12 o'clock, and I still had 10 more minutes to go on my interview, fortunately I recorded this thing. Why, uh, there was a knock on the door and there was the head bellman. And he said, Mr. Wenrick, you're wanted downstairs. So that terminated the interview. So I tagged right along, the nurse put a shawl over him, they had him in a wheelchair and took him down. And there was the American Legion band getting ready for a parade, and they serenaded him right out in front of the hotel, playing all of many of his songs, put on your old gray bonnet, when you wore a tulip and I wore a big red rose, sweet cider time when you were mine, where do we go from here, boys, all that stuff, and it was really quite touching. So the interview was great, and I still have the tape with the, with the um, tag on there from the, the band playing and stuff, and that was quite, quite novel to have a, be so well liked that uh, the band would pause in their, in their march efforts to serenade this man. Well, Percy Henry was one of many, and I, when I was younger, I used to spend a lot of time looking these men up. For some reason, I missed Jimmy Scott, but uh, we've treated him well since then, and working hard on treating Arthur Marshall as well, though I did get to meet him. But here's a tune by a guy named Joe Jordan, who was uh, a real, real interesting fellow. He wrote the Teas and Rag, which was uh, Nick LaRocco, the original Dixieland band. Later on, put out a tune called the original Dixie One Step, and he borrowed the trio from Joe's Teas and Rag. Teas and Rag came out in 1909. It was made popular, the lyrics were added in 1910, and Blossom City on Broadway was the gal that sang it. And in 1917, Nick Verola wrote the, the original Dixie Land One Step, borrowed the trio. In 1922, after our, uh, Victor Gramophone and Talking Machine Company had published uh, the, the, the album of four, four records with uh, the original Dixie Land band, by uh, Joe Sudo, 
And every year he put money in, it cost him about 100 bucks every year to keep that suit going. Well, it was about uh, 20 years ago, and it was Thanksgiving Day, and uh, I was saying, Joe, why do you keep putting 100 bucks in every year for this? I said, if you think you're gonna win it, he says, I'm not leaving this earth until I get my money. <laughs> and I always thought that was a great line. Because on that day, a special delivery letter came from RCA Victor, who now owned Victor Gramophone Talking Machine Company, and he received $75,000 in back royalties. Plus, he made up put a thousand, a thousand copies of music that would accompany the letter, which all said, the original Dixon Island, one step, with the main theme, the trio, from Joe Jordan's Tease and Ray. So he got his money, and then he died. But anyway, <laughs> am I growing up my money, says Joe. It was, um, I'll tell you one other reason, it's not to bend your ear here, but when we made the record of the Golden Reunion in Ragtime, uh, Fletcher Smith at the studio at, uh, where they were recording Woody Woodbury and a few others, and uh, Gypsy Rose Lee and a few other people. And uh, we were all there because the men were black and there was no place for them to go to a decent restaurant to get anything to eat, but everything was catered in. And one day Joe was standing at the counter and we had the tapes running. Nobody's paying any attention, but the tape was running anyway. And Joe's standing there, he says, uh, Yubi? He says, so where's the knife for the mustard? And Yubi says, I don't know, Joe, but I don't know where any knife for the mustard. He said, hey, Charlie Thompson, where's the knife for the mustard? And uh, Charlie said, look at Joe, I don't know where any knife for the mustard. And then afterwards, Joe says, damn it, if a fight broke out in here, there'd be knives all over this place. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Joe wrote a lot of tunes like Brother-in-law Dan, you make love much better than your brother Joe can. Uh, I might do that for you if you'd like. And the other one was the Teasing Rag, another one was Lovey Joe. Uh, uh, he wrote, oh, any number of tunes. Uh, but this is the Teasing Rag. 1909, lyrics in 1910. Thank you. 
was this time by two guys from Delaware, written in 1919, and that the blues, my naughty sweetie gives to me. Because there's the blues you get for women when you see them going swimming and you haven't got a bathing suit yourself. <laughs> That's the kind of blues you can have if you're a male. <laughs> That you get from loneliness. There are blues that you get from pain. There are blues when you're lonely. If you're one and only, that's the blues that are so hard to explain. There are blues that you get from crying. But the meanest, meanest, meanest blues, it seems. The blues that's always on my mind. The blues of the very meanest kind. The blues my body sweetie gives to me. There's a blues you get from women when you see them going swimming and you haven't got a bathing suit yourself. There's a blues you get from quicker when you're drinking lots of liquor and a cutie grabs your bottle off the shelf. There's a blues you get from waiting at the dock, wondering if that boat is going to rock. There's a blues you get from fretting in a taxi cab or something while the cabin man monkeys with the clock. There's a blues you get from trying to keep your uncle Joe from dying and he'll never get you in his will. There's a blues you get from kisses when you're walking with your missus and a cutie waves at you high bill. But the blues that'll make you jump, shake and shiver, make you want to go and jump to the missus if you're at the blues, my naughty sweetie, give to me.
time again, Marvin Wynn, 1912. He's a rag picker. He's a rag time picking man.
Hans Gustav Snyder was the provider of groceries, canned goods, and such. He read so much of the war till himself and his store were both what is known as in Dutch. His brain had been feeding on too much war reading when night he awoke in a fright. So he ran on the stairs, fell over two chairs, and turned on the grocery store lights. Now there were eight shells bursting near and far above that Russian caviar, a Bismarck herring by itself, a pushing all the French peas off the shelf. An Irish potato started to cry when a Spanish onion caught his eye. Frankfurters rolling all over the floor, shouting aloud were the dogs of war. There was Sonny Jim upon a horse so moving down. With all his force of paprika getting weaker and shouting aloud, won't you open the door? Then a couple of tough, the other roll shot for Swiss cheese pump full of holes in the terrible war in Snyder's grocery store. the fresh navy beans, while the Limburger cheese greatly strengthened the breeze with anchovies, prunes, and sardines. Fighting an army of Dago salami, and this was only half what he saw. So he jumped in the pit, put ice on his head, and went on the wagon once more. But there were eight shells bursting near and far, about that Russian caviar, Bismarck herring by itself, the pushing all the French peas off the shelf. An Irish potato started to cry when a Spanish onion caught his eye. Frankfurters rolling all over the floor, shouting aloud were the dogs of war, there was a sunny gem on a horse swooping down. With all his force of paprika getting weaker and shouting aloud, won't you open the door? Then a couple of tough, the other rolled, shot a poor Swiss cheese plum full of holes in the terrible war in Snyder's grocery store. Some war. one time of meeting a fellow named Harry Bruce who just uh, in Virginia City, Nevada, who just got out of prison after 35 years. He was a piano player, and he kept up his piano playing in the prison, and when he went back up to Virginia City, I got to know him fairly well. And uh, he was a very good friend, he had pictures to prove it of uh, Judy Bowman. Judy Bowman was from Fort Worth, Texas. Judy Bowman wrote the 5th Street, 6th Street, 9th, 10th, 11th Street Rag. And there was uh, rags, and there was only one rag, one street left. That was 12th Street. And he didn't score on any of the former. This was it. So he wrote 12th Street rag, and he had a thousand copies printed. He used to sell them off the piano for 25 cents. Somehow or another, J.W. Jenkins Music Company of Kansas City got hold of a copy, and they made a deal with him. And this was his bread and butter number. The lyrics were added in 1917. Now the copyright says 1910, which is when the tune was originally published, but was published by J.W. Jenkins in 1914. But the lyrics were added in 1917. Thus, the word jazz sneaks in, sneaks in the lyrics. But anyhow, a little story about him. He uh, he had one leg. He was missing a leg. I don't know why that was there, but he and actually the the rag itself is based on a tune in 1904 uh, called a uh, the Chicago rag. And uh, if you there is a similarity, uh, the repetitious but the syncopation that he incorporated. And he also made it verbose as far as music is concerned, with a lot of runs and, and uh, octaves going up and down with another. But actually, it's a delightful tune, and if you take great liberties with it, and each one just flavors the other. I've always uh, enjoyed playing this tune, even though it's, uh, it's certainly not the toughest tune in the world to play. But it's certainly melodic and it's great on the ear, and people do like it, especially at 2 o'clock in the morning. You know, at 2 in the afternoon, they like it too, apparently. We'll find out in a minute.
music and the baby set your heart to pulsate the evening and the night. Cleo Patra on the night of February, right in the style here. She gonna need all this ragtime too. Oh boy, what joy. I burn my clothes for Robin Evan. Wish I had a million women solving and all this lurking. Gonna tell another story. Worry about a listen here today. Where the thousand miles of Murray dance, the bonnie chips are chores that he can dance the night and day away. Won't you come with me, fill my heart with glee? And your story that was meant for you and me while we're dancing to that twelfth street rag. Signed by J. Hill, J. Louis Hill, and he wrote this in 1910. It was in the Follies of 1915. It's entitled "Listen, Listen," or "The Men Were Dancing." Listen, listen, listen to the dreamy music play. It's reminiscent. Listen, listen, what you're missing? That tune that keeps you sway. Wind up the music, quite so sweet, I can't keep still upon my feet. Ragtime music to me is just a perfect treat, because it really can't be beat. When out of Paul and you're feeling rather blue, listen, I'll tell you what to do. Commence a dancing, commence a dancing, to start a prancing, a right to left a glancing, a moochie dancing, sliding line of trancing. Get your partner now and hold her. I lead you forward, a little over. Now work your shoulders, snap your fingers, one and all in the hall and the ball, that's all. Now work your 
your shoulders, snap your fingers, run an all in the hole at the ball, that's all. Kerry Mills, he wrote this in 1907, entitled Ragtime Dance, with an introduction to a tune called Smokey Mokes. It was this way, 1907. Saturday night. <laughs> First little toddy for Don't forget, folks, for banned drinks. I 
like her mother, she was quite contrary, hard to understand. When her mother was a miss, her old daddy told me to show your colors in a real old-fashioned way. Cause that's the wrong, wrong way to tickle Mary. Got a wise up boy today. Now fathers love to see us twice a year, twice a year, twice a year. When he comes round, he always leaves some money for mother dear. He used to breakfast with us every morning. And on our cakes molasses he would smear. But one day he kissed the cook and we told Ma to take a look. So Pa's allowed to see us twice a year. <laughs> Damn rats. <laughs> An equestrian tune from the great Commonwealth of Maryland. Horsey, keep your tail up. Horsey, keep your tail up. Keep the sun out of my mind. Horsey, keep your tail up. Horsey, keep your tail up. Never mind about the flies. His tail is short, it's rather thick, he's really got an awful kick. Oh, horsey, keep your tail up, horsey, keep your tail up, keep the sun out of my mind. Oh, paid the rent for Mrs. Rip Van Winkle when Rip Van Winkle went away. Cause he was gone for 20 long years, who was it kissed away her tears? There was no one around the place, no one for her to embrace. The landlord always found her with a smile on her face. So who paid the rent for Mrs. Rip Van Winkle when Rip Van Winkle went away? Oh, those wild, wild women, those wild, wild women, they're making a wild man of me. My father brought me up as a minister's son, but all those naughty girls, look what they've done. Those wild, wild women, those wild, wild women are taking advantage of me. Tells you what they've done to Mark Antony. You can just imagine what's gonna happen to me. With those wild, wild women, those wild, wild women, they're making a wild man, they're making a wild man, they're making a wild man of me. Think of the guys that have preceded us. Joe Jordan, UB Blake, Charlie Thompson, Don Yule, who used to be here, and a few others. All playing those long engagements at the Great Saloon in the Sky. And it's nice to recall them because they were part of this action. Especially Don Yule, who uh, I really uh, treasure as a real dear friend. He's awfully a very fine pianist. Play anything like Jelly Roll Morton. And in just an honor of Don Yule, I'd like to do a tune. Uh, Wolverine Blues by Jelly Roll Martin. I had a little poopery of some of his things all thrown in together. Uh, but the original theme is the Wolverine. Actually, the two was written in 1915, but published in 1922. At least that's what Jelly Roll Martin said. <laughs>
seven numbers all together. But this is one of his prettiest, pretty baby, because everybody loves a baby, that's why I'm in love with you, pretty baby. Thank you. 
Some of these days, which Sophie Tucker picked up on in 1913, tune was written in 1910. And she used it as a signature tune all the rest of her career, which lasted 75 years almost. And uh, she always saw that he got his royalty checks even during the Depression, which was the thing that saved him. But in 1917, he wrote something for himself. I had a chance to talk with him, with Yubi Blake, at the hunt when we were out there one time. And he said that he got great joy out of the circle of keys. And that the Dark Town Stars Ball has that, really. It has every key imaginable you are through the whole cycle. Anyhow, the Dark Town Stars Ball, 1917, by Shelton Brooks. <laughs> Canadian Capers. This is a very fine ragtime novelette. 